Hi, my name is Bob Grinier, volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project, and I am here in Switzerland, a nice temperate Switzerland, and uh, I am here with Slobodan Stankovic. He... Hello. Hello. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, tell us a bit about yourself and what got you interested in HHO, how long you've been doing it, etc. Well, um, I've been doing this uh, for about 15 years. I uh, started with my father, I started to, to replicate some electrolyzer from Stanley Mayer at, at times and then we moved to uh, another standard, more standard electrolyzers and that's how we started and uh, what we tried to uh, uh, do is uh, some sort of experiments together and we uh, started with this oxyhydrogen stuff so um, which was really interesting and uh, that's how we started and we I still continue even if I'm alone my father is now retired, so uh, I'm on my way with this uh, with this stuff. So we're just ma uh, a few feet away from his wonderful lab, which I've had a quick look through, and we will do a separate video on that. But what we're going to do in a minute is we're going to look at some of the materials that I brought and that he has on hand. And we're putting this out there so that you in the community can suggest things you would like to see. We're going to talk a few uh, about a few things that we would like to do. I know Slobodan's got some things that he would like to do. Uh, uh, what, what would you like to do most? Oh, um, transmutations. See a lot of transmutations with different elements. Uh, and also see uh, we talked about uh, before with the uh, mosons me uh, so uh, uh, masers sorry mosons masers and uh, try to replicate also these, these things so. so this was uh, you showed me in um, uh, ICCF 22 yeah, right. uh, something that you had seen and uh, you said what's going on here there's a little beam coming through this yeah, uh, carbon exactly. crucible a uh, graphite cru right. crucible yeah. I said I think you've got a maser and the reason yes. was is because I tried to explain what had happened with the 10 yen coin in Japan when I was testing a Mars gas and I knew from the I think it was the Tokyo University or something they did a study on uh, a Mars gas and found that it had OH in there and I found out that OH self mazes, uh, and it's something that does this in the cosmos. It's one of the most uh, uh, common uh, compounds in the cosmos, and it self mazes. So I thought maybe it's producing a maser, i.e., the OH is being excited. It emits a certain frequency of RF that stimulates another OH group to do that, and they bounce back between each other and they get into coherence. And, and uh, I thought that this might be the case. So when he showed this to me, I thought, well, that's what it's doing. <laughs> so, yeah, we'd like to do that. Uh, I think what we'll do now is we'll take a look at the material because we've got quite a lot of it. Yeah, and we're going to have to be prioritizing and we need to build some equipment as well before we can do our work. But uh, we're trying to think twice and cut once, right? Yeah, exactly. exactly. So let's go and have a look at what we have. Let's go. So I'll start by a quick uh, reference to 20th century alchemy by uh, Joe E. Champion, and this is from June 1993. And just after his sort of uh, contributors and so forth and his table of contents uh, and his introduction, he has this phrase here, which I will read out. So here he says, scientists are educated to believe that all new knowledge comes in tiny increments, grains of sand piled one on another. Indeed, that is how most knowledge is gained. Therefore, they are never prepared for the visionaries who arrive at new insights which, overnight, utterly transform an entire field of inquiry. Dean Coote's Phantoms. And I think this is quite apt because I think probably Yul Brown and his discovery of Brown's gas, which one would think is just stoichiometric oxygen and hydrogen electrolyzed from water, doesn't do what you would expect just recombine when it interacts with other materials. It interacts in very unusual ways. And one of the things that he demonstrated was whatever elements he took, if he applied enough of the Brown's gas in uh, certain combinations of elements, you would end up with a flash and uh, what would be produced at the end of it was carbon and in that case um, that also included whether you started with radioactive elements and that is something we are very very much interested in when we are dealing with potential solutions to fixing Fukushima. So this video is part of the Fix Fuku or the Project Fuku uh, experiment and let's see what we have to work with. 
So one of the uh, ideas is to take a block of uh, calcium carbonate. This is cut from a mountain in Vietnam, and we actually have five times as much, but it was too much to send in the post from the party that was in, in between the quarry and ourselves. So we have this uh, approximately two centimeter by 10 by 10 centimeter block uh, to work with, and we will take samples of this for uh, before and after material. And if you heat this to, I think about over 850 degrees C, carbon dioxide comes off and you end up producing something called calcium uh, oxide here. And if you leave calcium oxide for long enough in here, it absorbs CO2 from the environment and becomes CaCO3. Um, and th therefore it's a reversible process. But we're interested in this calcium oxide. And I've argued because uh, um, calcium does not transmute uh, readily, or rather, should I say, uh, if you fusion using Lena, it appears to produce a lot of calcium. And if you fission uh, doing Lena, it seems to produce a lot of calcium. Well, if you start with calcium, it's not going to want to do a lot of either. Uh, and it's already there. And so this uh, is a, a good base for the um, exposure of HHO. Now, limelight was invented in the 1820s, I believe, sometime around in the early 1800s. And uh, that is where you take uh, lime, which is calcium oxide, and you expose it to uh, gas, and it eventually became hydrogen or, oxy or oxyhydrogen gas. And this grows in glows incredibly brightly, and that is why the phrase where the phrase limelight comes from. And uh, I believe that uh, there's a good chance that we could create coherent matter using this, and that if that material that the the water that is uh, uh, used as a, and electrolyzed is uh, containing uh, tritium uh, then if you do the Parkamov reaction tables by putting in T and ca and calcium in the uh, Parkamov reaction tables at nanosoft.co.nz and you run the reaction tables what you end up with is the production of helium uh, and uh, uh, potassium-39, the most abundant uh, isotope of potassium in nature, uh, from tritium and uh, calcium-40, which is the most abundant form of calcium in nature. And so uh, I would say that nature would want to do this. Now, we don't have any tritium water, sadly, at the moment, and protium and uh, deuterium-based water do not do this reaction, they would tend to produce um, higher isotopes in the case of deuterium of calcium. And in that respect, we actually can enrich our uh, water that we are going to electrolyze at some point uh, with this deuterium oxide that we have here. And because it's such a small proportion of normal water that is deuterium, uh, this five milliliters into the two liter minimum that goes into Slobodan's electrolyzer. Uh, this will significantly uh, increase the amount there. And the hope is that when we test, uh, ideally with some method like um, matrix-assisted laser dispersion ionization time-of-flight spectroscopy like we did at uh, uh, a university in Brno before, uh, we or some other uh, isotopic uh, determinant uh, uh, technology, uh, maybe ICPMS, but they tend to use argon, which is close to uh, uh, to 40 uh, calcium. Um, we, we might be able to detect an increase in isotopes when we use uh, deuterium oxide in there, in the calcium, because calcium actually has many stable isotopes uh, uh, by, that means they have more neutrons in there, so they can accept neutrons. And the reality is that uh, I believe that the tritium-laced water at Fukushima will also have quite a lot of uh, deuterium in it as well. And, and so uh, it will be able to soak up those uh, isotopes. So if that works, then we have an, uh, a potential for uh, uh, fixing the Fukushima water. And uh, because we don't have the tritium, by being able to use the deuterium, we will have a means to uh, uh, show that there is an active role being played by the calcium in the calcium carbonate that is reduced to calcium oxide. We actually have some calcium here, uh, uh, just because we do. Uh, and another way that we can potentially deal with this same question, uh, tritium is a beta isotope. And it would appear that um, 
if you have neutrinos of whatever form, if they do interact with a beta isotope, they can cause a beta decay. And in fact, I think MIT have a uh, detector that's based on uh, tritium uh, to detect for neutrinos, but it's not very successful. I think it detects about three neutrinos a year. Uh, however, Parkamov used material that has uh, short half-lives like uh, uh, the um, cobalt 60, I think five point whatever year half-life. I'm interested in this element here, carbon, and this is not just pure carbon, this is uh, crushed charcoal. And the reason I've chosen crushed charcoal instead of graphite uh, is because in the case of this carbon, this carbon will contain carbon-14, and that's the basis for radiocarbon dating, and in fact I prepared this carbon to test with the Marza gas in Japan, but we had such little time with the gas we couldn't test it, and uh, I actually did put some of this carbon in a metal vial and put it into the cesium uh, vibrator experiment that actually did transmute the cesium, and I published that data in my poster presentation at ICCF 22. But anyway, the point being is that we can use both uh, radiocarbon dating and a beam line isotopic separation, which is our preferred method in a uh, northern European country. Uh, they will take this carbon, the before and after, and they will put it on this beam line and look at the ratio of 12, 13 and 14 carbon isotopes. And the premise is that if we can show that the carbon, which we have plenty of samples of before, and after, the before, if it shows uh, a carbon ratio natural, i.e. it's basically just dyed tree in the last sort of five, six, seven, eight years, it's just the same amount of carbon-14 you would normally expect to see in just dead material. And then we treat this with, in this case, HHO, and uh, if it can form this coherent matter, it can form these uh, 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 cold neutrinos, and the cold neutrinos interact and cause the uh, stimulated beta decay of the carbon-14, then you would be able to tell that by seeing a different ratio in carbon atoms uh, in the fact that the 14 carbon would become uh, 14 nitrogen through the beta decay and it would make the carbon appear as if it's very very old when it is not actually very very old. So this is kind of like almost a better test than the uh, with, with our uh, piece of uh, calcium carbonate here uh, because uh, this if we can uh, cause carbon-14 decay to decay, this actually has a, a half-life that is um, in the uh, many thousands of years, like I think 6,700 or something, plus or minus 30, something like that. Off the top of my head, I might be wrong. You can look at it Wikipedia if you wish um, and, and find out what the actual amount is. But of course, um, tritium is 11 point whatever, half year, uh, its half-life is 11 point something years. So if we can take something using a Mars gas uh, or in this case HHO, and we can cause the beta decay of carbon-14, then this will be a um, uh, something that for me would be a slam dunk argument uh, to uh, fixing the tritium. Uh, if you can do something that's 6,700 years or, or whatever it is, 5,700 years, it's in the thousands of years, uh, and it can cause that to decay near uh, instantly, then we have a good chance of arguing that it can do the same to tritium, which wants to decay naturally far more intensely. Now, the thing is that if we blow the carbon um, uh, with the, the the gas jet, that's probably going to fly everywhere. So we kind of need to compact this into a pill. And to do that, uh, Slobodan is engineering something very similar to what I showed at the All Russia Plasma Physics Institute in North Moscow in 2015 when I was visiting Parkamov and uh, he's bought this uh, press over here or parts to build a press and we need to go and get some metal to complete this uh, some uh, screw rods and and so forth uh, but th this component here uh, how much was it was it you said three hundred dollars just for this little item here um, he didn't have the uh, capability to machine hardened steel but if you look at this it has this uh, little plunger here and you have your other end over here and you can put your material on there and uh, uh, You can see how good the tolerance is on here if I push this in here the air pressure is actually able to move this up 
Um, so it's very, very tight tolerances on here. So this is this is quite nice for producing our uh, uh, little tablets that we can experiment with, and we have lots of materials to experiment with that otherwise would fly everywhere uh, if we didn't have them pressed into a uh, tablet form. So you can go and look at, I think it's called Pressing Matter on our MFMP YouTube to see what the Russians were using in their experiments uh, in 2015. Uh, and we're going to try and create something similar. So one thing we might want to consider is the potential of making gold from base metals. Why not? We started off with a, a comment uh, from a, uh, a person attempting to do alchemy. So we have our pill press here. Uh, I have our monoatomic gold, and this would be considered our philosopher's stone. And uh, uh, this is... Um, I tested this in... Uh, Berno, I think in 2017 or to early 2018, maybe, and it did test to be what um, uh, David Hudson claimed uh, monatomic gold tested as. I will publish that at a separate time. But that is our supposed philosopher's stone, uh, and it's extremely fine nanoparticles, so it definitely needs to be put in a press. Here we have potassium carbonate. Now, potassium was what the um, people... Uh, who did uh, uh, alchemy used and this was originally comes from charcoal uh, maybe maybe we need some charcoal in there so we can we can throw a, a bit of that in there as well into our pill and we have an option of lead shot or lead powder obviously we're going to create uh, the need here for a vacuum hood of some type before we do this experiment and uh, create a pill from this material now the potassium in my view uh, if you are creating the cold neutrinos or the coherent matter leads to the uh, decay of the potassium 40 that will release these 1.551 uh, mega electron volt betas that will stimulate the production of further coherent matter and intensify the exotic vacuum objects and uh, this creates this ball and uh, potentially this flash in which a case the um, the material uh, through electronuclear collapse would uh, uh, go into uh, what the alchemists called uh, prima materia, uh, where it doesn't have an identity. And the purpose of having the uh, monoatomic gold in there as a proportion in the mix is that this is already in a sort of uh, uh, a superconducting state and impervious to the temperature that the rest of the material is going at. But when this goes into the prima materia and wants to become uh, something... The idea is that the monoatomic gold here is the template for which this material would then reform back into solid matter and uh, maybe it would um, uh, produce gold out of it. So this is a bit of fun uh, for the week uh, that we, we may attempt, uh, but we have, in my view, along, along with a bit of uh, carbon in there, and preferably charcoal, I think we have that. But we also have some uh, other uh, charcoal somewhere or carbon that we can get. We've certainly got some graphite rods uh, that we can bring. And, and so that's a little bit of fun. So this tops out this video. The next video will be about the material we tested in Japan. And then we'll do a video on the detection methods we have and, and sampling. And uh, so uh, tune in for the next video. And uh, I think we're going to have a lot of fun together this week.